Hey, good morning, everybody. You sound alive and vibrant. That either means you've been sick all week and sleeping, and you're just happy to be out, or 2024 is starting off good. So we'll, uh, we'll let you pick which one. Hey, uh, real excited to be with you guys this morning, uh, especially as we uh, just launch into a new year. With that comes uh, just, I, I don't know, I, I think I said this last week, there, there's just a newness uh, when, when January hits. I know nothing cosmically shifts from December 31st when the ball drops in New York or anything like that. I just, uh, there's, there's something uh, that shifts and, and it almost feels like there's patterns that can break. There's things you were doing that you don't have to do. There's things you've not been doing that you can start doing. Um, and in the middle of all that, I think we're trying to figure out, so what is that and where do we go and how do we want to do that? Um, I, I want to start this uh, morning by taking you back to a moment in high school, uh, at my high school, not the actual high school, just when I was there. Uh, but, um, but when I got my first car, uh, I, uh, first of all, there was that moment of like unbridled freedom. You know what I'm talking about? Um, I grew up in Springfield and so uh, downstate in Illinois. And so uh, for me, it was kind of the like, you know, you couldn't just take a bus anywhere. I think there was two buses and I don't even know how it worked. I never saw anybody on them, but it happened. Um, but but for me, it was always one of those, like the car was the way for me to get out. Like that was my way of going and, and doing my thing. Uh, and after a while of driving the car, uh, I didn't know, my dad's a mechanic. Uh, I didn't know many mechanical things at that time. Uh, but after a while, and you've experienced this, is uh, I would realize as I'm driving, uh, is that I would be going straight, or at least that's the way the wheel was pointed, but then the car started drifting. Right, And this wasn't snow or ice or water or anything. It just started pulling off to the side. No matter how straight I held the steering wheel, uh, the car always seemed to pull off to the side. And in the middle of that, uh, I, I, I wanted to go this way. You see what I'm saying? But the car was going this way. Now, in Chicago, you've hit enough potholes where you've had to have this happen multiple times probably in your life. Uh, my dad, who's a mechanic, I called him and I said, hey, I think my truck's broken. Uh, and he informed me that it was not. Uh, but he did say uh, that after all of the miles, all the potholes, uh, with all of the wear and tear on the car, all the bumps, uh, that your car will start to drift. Uh, and he, uh, in his you know, all-knowing all power of being a mechanic, said, you, you, need, an, you need a shift, you need an alignment. Uh, you need to take it in and someone needs to calibrate your vehicle so that the direction that your steering wheel is pointing in, your wheels are actually going in that direction. Uh, as we live life over time with all the issues, with all of our situations, with all of the bumps in the road, the bruises, with losses that we've had, and all the wear and tear, our lives can start to drift. We want it to go this way. We think we're actually going this way, but in reality, it's pulling off one way or the other. Uh, we may be aimed in one direction, but everything seems to pull into another. And the reality for us is we also need spiritual alignment. Uh, we, we need to make sure that our lives, our souls, our prayer, our, the direction of our life is actually aligned to where we want it to go. You, you following me? And a lot of times it goes unnoticed and it goes unseen. It, just like your car, you probably don't realize how much you're pulling to this side to overcompensate because of the drift. And it can be exhausting. As we are trying to constantly pull things back together, but things are just out of alignment and there's habits we used to have. Maybe you used to get up early and you used to spend time with the Lord and over time you, uh, that didn't happen. You got sick and so that all just fell apart and uh, you try to squeeze something in sometimes. You used to have a deep community uh, and you stop meeting with the group or you don't have a new group and so all of a sudden there's questions that aren't being asked anymore. There's a fellowship that isn't happening and all of a sudden you look around and you realize, man, something shifted. I don't know if I noticed it. I don't know if I saw it, but something over time shifted. This year, I want us to look at the direction and trajectory of our lives and align the way, align where we are, who we are, and what we're doing with the words and the ways of Jesus, right? Uh, not just memorizing scripture, though I hope you do that, or reading it, uh, but also looking at what was the way Jesus did it. What was the attitude that Jesus carried? What were the responses and uh, attitudes that Jesus had? How did he treat people? How did he look at people? How do we align our lives with the way of Jesus? When we believe in Jesus, we believe in who he is. 
he's Lord. C.S. Lewis famously paints this picture of, you know, either Jesus is lying, he's crazy and he's a lunatic, or he's Lord, but we don't get to pick any other option. And when we put our faith, when we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, uh, we believe that he is Lord, meaning that we are under him. He is the king and we are citizens of the kingdom. He is the master. We are the servant. Whatever he says we do. And over time, we know that that's where we want to go, but it drifts. What Jesus calls us to is to become his disciples and to make disciples in other people. Maybe for you, that's where you want to head or maybe even think you're heading, but something got out of alignment along the way. You want to live, speak, behave, react, and treat people like Jesus, but in reality, your life might be out of alignment. You want to be a part of God's mission to reach people far from God and walk with them as they grow uh, into becoming a disciple of Jesus, but in reality, that part of your life may be out of alignment as well. So here's some diagnosis questions. What is the area of your life that you are surrendering to Jesus recently? What area for you have you just said, man, God, I, I need to work on this? Or has the Spirit just pointed something out and you don't want to deal with it, but it's, this is what we're working on? Do you have one of those? Have you been actively uh, putting yourself up on the altar and sacrificing your Lord over? And, is there something in you? Maybe it's a language or an attitude or reaction or a, a, an area of unforgiveness or uh, it could be a lot of things, but is there something where you brought that back? Because if, if you're... If, if the spirit isn't working with us in some of those areas, maybe we're out of alignment. Another diagnosis question is this. Who have you asked to help form your life to be more like Jesus? Do you have someone ahead of you that's helping you go where you want to go? Do you have someone who is asking you questions that you don't know how to or you don't think to ask or know to ask? Is there someone uh, who is helping form you to become a disciple? Do you have people uh, in your life that are helping shape you and mold you and create you, uh, uh, to create you, but, but form you to be more like him? Another evaluation, I could go forever with these, but this is the last one that I'm gonna mention. Who have you been living life with to help them form, or help form them as a disciple of Jesus? Do you have someone that you're helping to shape be more and more like him. My experience has been this, is if I've got somebody who's shaping me or helping shape me, and the Spirit of God is using me to help shape somebody else, God just does things in my life that cause me to be more and more like Jesus. I have people asking me questions that help me think about, I didn't realize how out of tune that was with where I wanna be, or I'm talking with somebody and I say something and I know it didn't come from me and it came from God and I'm listening to it going, God, that was good. I need to write that down for myself. You know what I'm saying? Because I, like, I, I need to do that too. And I just said it and it, someone's like, wow, that was really helpful. I'm like, yeah, me too. Yeah, that was really, right? There, there's something that happens in, as we are in the disciple making process, becoming one and making and form one. And what I'm saying is sometimes we get out of alignment in those areas and we don't realize it and we forget what's missing. Uh, we forget everything that's uh, uh, happening. In your car, if your car's out of alignment, your tires will wear differently. Your car will start to malfunction and, and tear down just because you're, uh, there's parts of your car that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. It, there's a strain on them that they weren't created for. And the same thing's true with us, is when our lives are out of alignment, we feel that strain. Uh, there's, there's a busyness that happens. There's uh, things that just fall off. There's, there's a joy and a fullness of life that's missing because our lives aren't in alignment with what we are called and created to do. Many of us in our discipleship need what we will be calling a disciple shift. Uh, we, we need to shift our lives or align our lives back, pointed to in pursuit of King Jesus. In the beginning of this year, we're going to align our lives to the words and ways of Jesus. Over the next three weeks, the next 21 days, we will be aligning our life to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus does. Uh, in, in that, uh, tomorrow we've got, uh, we will start a bunch of opportunities. One of those will be this room, like Josh mentioned and uh, Zach mentioned in the video, is we will be, uh, this room will become a prayer room. Now, some of you just need to come sit in quiet because you don't know where else to find that. 
Uh, if you're like me, I, I have a, there's a spatial thing. There's places where things happen. That was one of the biggest, for me, one of the biggest frustrations with COVID was uh, the house became school. It became my office. It became, I think, our house. I don't, we lost that somewhere, right? There, everything became in one space, and some of you just need a new space. You, you need to let this become a place over the 21 days where you just come and you, you pray, and you get to just be with the Lord. Uh, and so in here, uh, as mentioned, there'll be a bunch of different stations. One of those is over the 21 days, these back glass walls in our sanctuary will become prayer walls. Uh, over on this wall, uh, uh, between the middle door and this door over here on the west side, uh, is going to be where we are, are uh, writing names on post-it notes of people uh, who are far from God and, and distant from any kind of Christian community. Uh, lost people that we want and we're asking God to move and, and what we'll see form over 21 days, uh, starting after service, we'll invite you to do that, is just before you leave, is to go write names down. Or maybe it's during the last song, you've got a name burning on your heart and you would love for the church to be praying over them. Uh, and you may just say something like my cousin. Maybe you don't wanna write their name down, it's fine. But, but, but to put those names up, so we have that over here. And then this wall over here uh, will be a place where we can kind of write our own prayer requests. Here's something that I'm asking for a breakthrough. Here's an area where I'm wanting the Lord to move in. Here is uh, something I've been long asking the Lord for but has not yet happened. Some of you uh, have just some healing that needs to happen. Some of you, it's, uh, you've got someone going through something and you're asking for physical healing or a job or all kinds of things, financial stuff. And so we want that to be a place where we say, this, these are the things that us as a church are praying for together. And over the 21 days, there'll be people in this room. That wall will stay up. Uh, uh, and over the 21 days, we'll get to see the prayer requests of our church family over people that we're praying over and things in our own lives that we're asking our church to pray for with us. And you don't have to put your name on it. You don't have, we don't need DNA samples. It's just a list, right? And so we want you to engage in that. Uh, we'll also be having Friday nights at 6.30 in this room. We'll be having worship services, uh, prayer nights starting this, this Friday. And, and here's what I know happens. You will have all the intentions of coming, and then Friday at 4, you're going to realize my sweatpants and my couch feel like a better ministry, right? And you're going to think, ah, I'll just hit the next one. There's three, you know? So if I don't, you know, two out of three, that'll, that, that's a kind of batting average that'll get you in the Hall of Fame. That's good, right? I'll, I'll hit for that. And then you know what happens the second week, and by the third week, you're like, oh, we'll do this again next year. It'll be fine, right? Uh, what I'm asking you to do is, would you, would you plan on it? Uh, put it in your calendar. I promise you, whatever you're going to do on Friday night will not fill you the way worship will. Uh, whatever you have planned on Friday night to renew your heart after a long week will not do what praying together will do. So please plan on being here for that. And then finally, uh, as mentioned in uh, the Church Center app, uh, there will be a 21-day prayer guide that we put together that will help you uh, just kind of have some prayer prompts. You may not use them. You may cling to them, uh, but it's a resource for you just to, so we can be praying for the same things together every day as we walk through that. We want you to engage. We want this to be an important part of the way you start your year because some of us need to get our lives back into alignment. Uh, would you stand as I read? Uh, and then we will go forward in scripture together. It's just one verse, uh, but it really encapsulates where we want to go today. David praying in Psalm 27, verse 4, says this. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you, as we move, Father, what we're asking, God, if, if, if that isn't what we want, if we've got a bunch of things that we want, if the desire of our heart is that plus other things, God, would you, would you, during our time together, would you, would you dial down the importance of all of that? Would you help us see clearly? God, would we, would we be able to get a, a, a reminder? Would you impress the importance? Would you put the weight of the reality on us? How good it is to be in your presence and just to be with you? And God, would you renew and restore the desire we have to want that and to pursue that, uh, that it's the one thing we ask and that we seek, that, that the one thing 
uh, God, beyond all of our prayer requests, that there's, there's one thing first. There's one thing. We just want to be with you. God, we seek it. We pursue it. We want it. So, Lord, would you, would you put that in our hearts? Would you ignite that fire? Would you renew that in us? Um, so that we can pray like David, and this would be the thing that we want. This is the one thing we pursue. Father, we, we give ourselves to you, and we ask that you would shape us in this moment. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Now, there's all kinds of things in Scripture, and as I was going through, I was finding myself deleting Bible verses over and over. Now, it's not a practice I tend to have is deleting Bible verses, but uh, in this conversation, there's so much of what it of the Bible speaking of us pursuing and being in his presence and God pursuing uh, and, and, and wanting to be with us. We want to be the kinds of people that share in David's desire in Psalm 27, where the one thing we ask, the one thing we ask and the one thing that we seek is that we can dwell in the house of the Lord. That word for house is where we get our word tabernacle or even temple from. It's this idea of this is, this is where the Lord lives. We want to we wanna live where the Lord lives. Uh, we, we don't want to be neighbors. Uh, we don't want to have to travel to get there. We, we just want to be there. Get it? I, I want to be in his presence. I want to I wanna, I wanna move in with him. I want him to move in with me. I, I, I want to uh, cohabitate this life with the Lord. That I can dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. You get the image? Not just when it's small group night or when I have my class or worship service. I want to be with him and I want him to be with me all the days of my life so that I can behold the beauty of the Lord or the delightfulness of the Lord. You get it? I, I, I want to I spend so much time and be there so long. I, I want to be able to soak in it. I, I want to be with God so I can just Behold him, so I can look at him, so I can see how good he is and how delightful he is, and to meditate in his temple, to inquire, is another way of saying meditate, to slowly digest, to soak, to process. It's kind of the image of a dry sponge in water, where the longer it sits there, the more it just soaks up into it. As I just, I just want to be there. I want to be with the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but over the year, I've prayed for other things other than this. This has not been the one thing, right? There's been moments where I'm like, Lord, I know you've got another car out there for me, right? Because this one is starting to not want to start. You know, it'd be good, right? Or Lord, there's a, a, a legitimate a, a prayer requests and people that I love, healings and things that I'm asking, God, would you move on this behalf? There's, break, there's, lo- there's people I know that have been praying for a long time for something that's good. And I'm asking God, God, would you do that? And I'm reminded over again, not to stop praying for those things, but is this the main thing that I'm seeking? Do I just want to be in the house of the Lord? Do I just want to be in his presence? Do I just want to be with him? Can we get to the place for some of us, maybe back to the place where the one thing we ask and pursue from God is just to be with him, to take in how good he is and to think or ponder, inquire on his things in his presence. The way we want more God is when we've been in his presence or in his absence. Here's what I mean. Sometimes when you've been in your absence, you start knowing what you're missing. It's kind of that prodigal son story. You've wandered and drifted away from home and you get far away and you realize, man, back, back with the Lord, I remember what he provided. I remember who he was. I remember, I remember him. And in his absence, I know I need his presence. Or sometimes, right, uh, you've been in the presence of the Lord. And, and it, I always get this. I've, I've confessed this to some of you at different points. Sometimes I'm reading a Bible verse. I'm like, this is really good. And I'm surprised at how, how shocked I am at how good I just remembered that the word was. Does that make sense? Am I the only, okay, I'm the only one. It's fine. Don't worry. Thanks, guys. That was good. Um, you know, like when you're in prayer and you're like, man, this, like, this, I, I could have been doing other things, but this, like, this was so filling. This was so rich. This was so good. And you realize because I've been in the presence, now I want to be in more of his presence. Because I've been with him, I want more time with him. I want to be with him. So whether it's his absence or his presence, it always puts in us a desire to want his presence. In our environment that we live in, the culture we're a part of, the lives that we live, 
The drift that can happen is we become so busy and exhausted and tired, and that's the only trick that Satan really needs to mess with this part of our life. We'll talk about spiritual warfare, and I'm not saying there's not real stuff that's happening that, that's outside of this, but I think so long, and C.S. Lewis does a really good job in screw tape letters and, and walking through this, so long as Satan can keep us busy, he's pretty much got his job done. Because we're too tired to spend, you know, Netflix is what we think we need. Sitting on the couch, going to, like, there's, there's other things we feel like would restore us. And so we start coming up with the list of other things that will renew our life, that will restore our soul, that will give us life. And in all of that, all he has to do is just keep us busy. And now we no longer really desire him, or at least we don't pursue him. And what we want to talk about today, because for us it's a gaping hole in our spiritual life, is sometimes in all of that, in the rat race of life, we forget the value of just being. Just sitting there. And I'll tell you, this is a rough era of history to be raising kids in. Because the tendency is to keep them busy. If we keep them busy, they'll be fine. If we keep a list of things for them to do, and don't worry, their friends are all busy. So now they're not doing what everyone around them is doing because they're all busy and we need to be busy to keep up with the busyness. And guess what we forgot? Just how to be. And just be present. And to be with each other. And the kind of life where the one thing we ask and that we would seek is just to be with God. That it's enough. That that's filling, that that's restoring, that that renews our hope, our joy, our strength. is just to be with him. A story that always gives me a disciple shift type alignment comes in Luke chapter 10 in the life of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is uh, traveling and he comes, it says in verse 38, now as they were traveling along, he entered, in, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary who was also seated at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha, pay attention to the words here, this is important, Martha was distracted with all of her preparations and she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the serving all by myself? Tell her to help me. Now that sounds abrupt, but I've prayed these prayers, right? We hear these, we hear Moses, right? Uh, saying, God, I'm the only one doing all this stuff. Nobody else cares. And God's like, there's like thousands of people that are willing to go. I don't know what you're talking about. Elijah, like running from God. He just called fire from heaven and he's running from God out in the wilderness. God, I'm the only one. And God's like, go back and find the thousands of people that are ready to go. You're, get out of your head. It's fine, right? That's the Don International version. But I'm, I, in my mind, that's how it goes, right? That's how I tell myself. That's how, this, is the, this is the way the word works in my life. So, and then we get to these moments and we hear Martha saying the same thing. And it's not because Martha's crazy. It's because she's normal. We pray the same prayers. God, how come nobody else? I'm the only one, right? I'm over here trying to do all this stuff. And there's Mary. And the same thing that's true here is true for us. But the Lord answered her and said to her, Martha, Martha. And you know if they say your name twice, it's bad. Oh, Don, Don. Oh, Don. And maybe Martha didn't have a middle name or that's, you know, Donald William, right? It'd be that kind of thing, right? So I don't know how it works, but like Martha, Martha. Pay attention to the two words. You are worried and distracted by many things. But the only thing, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part that will not be taken from her. And as we read this, we ask, so what's the good part? He never, listen, I'm, I'm a very direct person. If I ask a question, I'd like an answer. I don't need all the fluff. It's like, Jesus, yeah, but like, what's the good part? It's like, well, look at it. What do we know from the story? As you read through here, uh, all we know is that Martha is worried and distracted by many things. And the only thing we know about Mary is that she is seated with Jesus at his feet, just listening to his words. You get the image? Now that doesn't meet need, that doesn't mean, right, that things don't need to be done. 
But listen, if Jesus was over at my house for one night in human history and I got to host him, I'd like to think that I'd be sitting there at his feet. But I also know myself. And I'd probably be running around trying to do a bunch of stuff. I'd miss, he'd be waiting in my driveway because I'd forget something at Jewel. You know what I'm saying? Because it's all the stuff you've got to do. You've got to put on the show. You've got to roll things out. He's like, it's like God showed up and he didn't just like put on flesh and dwell among us. Like he knocked on my, he's at my house. Like literally he's here. And so I got to go do all the things. And it's like, hey, Don, where you at? It's like, I had to run to Milwaukee real quick and grab, I'll be right there. I promise. Right. And we learn as we read through this story, Martha's got this life where she is worried and distracted about many things. And Mary is just sitting with Jesus at his feet, just listening. I think it's powerful for us because we need to be asking ourselves, how often do we choose the good part? How often do we sit and just be in the good part? Not enough time, maybe. Maybe we're too busy, too tired. We don't know what to say. It's like, all right, I'll sit with him, but it's going to be like a staring contest. Like, I don't know if we'll make eye contact. I don't know what to, I can pray for like two minutes, but like, listen, 10 gets wild. I don't know what I'm going to say. So it's kind of this, like, I don't know what to do. And what kind of life are you living as you drift away from the good part? How well is it going for you when you don't choose that way? How is a busy or a a, a, a worried and distracted life going for us? It's a good question. The picture that is painted here is that it's not an action to be accomplished. It's a presence to be attentive to. It's just to be there and pay attention to sit and listen, to watch, to just be, to hear. And I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how God speaks. Sometimes I feel like it's more of a holy nudge. You know what I mean? Where it's just like, okay, I get it. Yeah, I don't know. But there's something about just being that happens that when I'm worried and when I'm distracted, I miss. As long as Satan can keep us in a life of worry and distraction, We will never align our lives to Jesus in the good part. Now, there's a book that I've loved, and we've, uh, Josh and Mike and I were talking about over the last couple weeks. There's a book by a guy named Sky Jatani called With. He's a Chicago area uh, pastor, was with Christianity Today for a long time. But in this book, With, he paints these pictures of how our relationship to God looks. The first one is this, and these are his doodles. He's a doodler, if you've ever followed him or watched him, um, is the idea that some of us, our relationship with God is to have a life under God. Right, uh, And in this kind of life, we are trying to do all the right things or behaving how we think we're supposed to, hoping that it appeases God, right? God, I'll do this. Uh, if you want me to do this, I'll do this. And that's just, I, I hope that's good enough for you. Uh, we constantly feel the guilt, fear, and the emptiness. And this relationship to God is doomed to fail. The second one he paints a picture of is a life over God. This one is where we just feel like we just have to be effective or productive, right? Uh, This is the kind of life where we use God-type language or kingdom-type language, but we really don't, for, for our lives to function the way that we're hoping they do, there's no need for prayer, spiritual discernment, or God's active participation in our lives. We know it because we can say things like this over and over, I'm good, I've got it, right? And this relationship with God is doomed to fail. He paints a picture of a life from God. This is the view of God, as he calls it, a divine butler or a cosmic therapist. Kind of a vending machine where you put your prayer in and you hope uh, that what you're asking for pops out. This, it looks more like material things than a relationship. He's more like Santa right? And this kind of relationship where we like him, but we ignore him until we need something from him. And then we go to him and try to paint a picture that we've been good. And this relationship is doomed to fail. There's another one and it's, he paints it as a life for God. And the language here can sound right, but it is a bit out of alignment. This one is a relationship where uh, it's all about what you can accomplish for God. And that's all that matters. Uh, This is the kind where the mission is the priority. 
The, the mission of God, you just have to be on mission. Everything's mission and not that God has a mission. Jesus was sent on a mission. There is a mission, but the mission becomes the priority. Think more like this. God's mission is important, but it's no substitute to the pursuit of God himself. Gordon McDonald calls it missionalism. He says it this way. It's the belief that the worth of one's life is determined by the achievement of a grand objective. And the shift here, and again, we're talking alignment, so sometimes this isn't like a radical like the wheel fell off. Sometimes the tires are rubbing a little wrong. This looks right, but the motives are off and will lead to a life full of kingdom language, but that's spiritually drifting. This relationship to God is doomed to fail. We are to be on mission with God, but it comes out of a place because we've been with God and we live with God. And wherever God goes, we go with him to do what he's doing as he pursues a mission. You get it? It's not to say, well, uh, you know, God wants us to go do, you know, reach all of our neighbors. Like, well, then we get so busy reaching our neighbors, we forgot to be with God. You get the image? And so he paints this final last picture, and it's not a life for God or from God or above God or under God, but it is a life with God. It paints this image of God's three-person nature in the Trinity is a God who is with God. We are made in the image. Part of what the created design to be is that we are created to be with him. The goal is not to appease God or to use God. The goal is God. We just want to be in his presence. We just want to be with him. We want to pursue him. We want to enjoy him. We want to desire him. We want to, as David says, behold his beauty and meditate on him in his presence. We just want to be there and wherever he is. And he's on mission, so we will be on mission if we're with him. And we want to reach our neighbors. And if we are with him, he's out reaching our neighbors. We will go do that. And we want to accomplish great things for his kingdom. And God's off doing those things. So long as we're with him, that will take care of itself. It reminds me of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. As if you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all that will be done. And we live a life where we're trying to go pick fruit instead of getting down and bearing a root system that actually produces it. You know what I'm saying? Psalms uses images all the time. And it's this intimate withness where it's not just with God, but it's actually, and you hear this language over and over through scripture. I would even say in the New Testament, it's, it's probably the chief way uh, that, that the New Testament writers uh, paint uh, an image of what, it, what it's like to live saved, where it's our life in God, in Christ. And all, throughout the Psalms, we hear this usage of he is my fortress, he is my refuge. He is my strong tower because when I'm in him, when I'm with him, that it doesn't matter what's happening out there. I know that if I'm here, I'm good. Uh, when we jump into the New Testament, uh, there's this uh, uh, model that's been going on in uh, uh, rabbinic society and culture where a rabbi, a Jewish leader, would have under them disciples. So this isn't Jesus just creates a new thing and says, you know, I'm just follow me, but I'm going to try to figure this out as we go. Uh, they would have known this was an image. The Greek word is mathetes. It's this idea, probably, uh, you know, we can say student or learner, but for us that gives in our context kind of a classroom feel. There's classroom moments, but it's not a classroom relationship. Um, what we probably the best way to think about it is kind of like a uh, like a trades apprenticeship. This idea is you learn as you go because you're with someone who knows it. You walk with them and they show you uh, how to do this and how to come around that and how to rethink these things and how to shape. It's it's you're learning things, but you're learning stuff by being with someone. You get the image. Uh, so much so. That in this time we find that a, 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 a rabbi uh, who was left-handed is that his disciples would try to do everything with their left hand to be like their rabbi. Disciples didn't just take notes from rabbis. They lived life with them in order to become like them so they could do what they did. So that when Jesus called these young fishermen to come follow me or to come after me and I will make you fishers of people. He was inviting them to this honored position of being with Jesus to become like him and to do what he does. 
The implication, the, the, the first thought they would have had isn't like, oh, let's hear what this guy's got to say. It's I get to be shaped and formed to become like him. We spent last summer in Jesus' final words, his teaching and prayer after the last supper and before he prays and is arrested in the garden. And he gives, here he gives this powerful image to help us understand what it means to be with Jesus. He uses this word in the Greek, it's meno, and it means to stay or to remain or to abide, not just next to, but in. That the witness is so close in here that it's not, there, there's no dividing line. It's we are in him. <clears throat> and he teaches it this way in John 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who remains in me. You get it? Not bumps into me on Sundays every now and then. Not throws a prayer request out when you remember something, but who remains, who, or who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you would bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciple. You get the image? He's saying you don't have to pursue trying to be loving, trying to be kind, trying to be faithful. If you abide in me, that's just the stuff that will happen. If you're with me, this is the life that produces. You don't have to try to be more loving. Be with me and love will produce itself out of my, by my spirit out of your life. If you keep my commands, you will remain in me. I think I skipped a verse. Verse nine, just as the fathers loved me, I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I've kept my father's commandments and I've remained in his love. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. You get the image? What he's saying is don't, this isn't kind of a like on-demand type moment where it's, you know, when I got time to sit down, I'll just pop in some Jesus. You know, I'll get the thing done and then we'll move on. It's the idea that you, you are in him and wherever you are, he's with you. And wherever he goes, you're already there because you're in him. So you're with him. You, you feeling it? So I want us to look at real quick, how do we be with Jesus? Now, I know if you're an English teacher, that is way off. I actually don't even know how to say it right. But we know we need to do there, so how do we do it? What does it look like just to be with him? How do I be with him? Because we're not good at being. We're good at doing. We're good at accomplishing. We're good at trying. But we need to be better at just being. And the first one, and this is just out of my own list, or as I read through scripture, it seems to be what scripture is always drawing us towards. The first one is this, is be with Jesus in the word. And I was having a conversation, Tom uh, Finnis and I were out and had coffee this week and we were talking through this and, uh, and as we were talking, the, 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 this kind of image came up and I was trying to think through, how, how do I be with Jesus in the word? Now, I know some, if you're English, you're getting like itchy right now. It's fine, we'll get through it, right? How do I be with Jesus in the word? Here's at least how it is for me is I try, when I'm, when I'm reading through the Sermon on the Mount, I'm, I'm trying to be in the second row or the first row with my notepad, just watching and listening and receiving these words like Jesus actually meant what he said. I'm trying to be with him there. When Jesus is healing by the pool, I'm trying to think, what would it be like to be in this pool and watch Jesus walk up to this guy? Or what would it be like to be the guy? And I want to be with him. I want, to, I want to experience it. I want to understand. I want to hear his tone of voice. I want to think about what his facial expression would have looked like. And I know that you can't pull that all out of scripture, but there's some things in there where it's like, I, I, want, to, I want to enter into the tense, tense moments that happen when Jesus is there. Right? How am I supposed to love my neighbor? And he starts talking about, you know, a, a good Samaritan. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, first of all, buddy, those aren't the good people. So I don't know what we're doing here. Right? And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, man, I want to. I want to be there. I want to, I want to sit in that tension. I want to understand what that is all about. I, I need to fully get there to fully understand what Jesus is saying. When Jesus is teaching parables, I, I, I want to enter into the parable. I want to be with him. 
I need to understand what it is to be with him as the prodigal son, but I also need to know what it means to be with him as the older son or older brother. You get what I'm saying? Is as you're reading through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John is what does it mean to just be with Jesus? That when he calls the disciples to come follow him, that as we open up the word, we follow him too. We, we're at the wedding at Cana with him. We're trying to put ourselves into those moments of, man, what, what, what is, how do we get to experience it from as much as what we can? Just like he called the 12 disciples to follow him as we're reading, we get to journey with him and watch him and listen and feel the tensions and find the freedom to the point where Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And because we've been with him in his word, we can say just like Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Second one is this, how do we be with Jesus? We be with Jesus in prayer. John chapter 16, verse 23, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. And we've talked about this a lot uh, about five months ago, so I don't want to get into it too much, but this idea, it doesn't mean that you put like a, like a NASCAR sponsor sticker that says, in Jesus' name, at the end of every prayer, and it's just going to magically happen, right? Well, I got the sticker, I said it, so we should be good, right? It's this idea that we're praying in the, in the person of Jesus, like in the likeness of him, that it, as Jesus is and as Jesus speaks and what he wants and desires, as we, as we pursue him, we find out what he wants and our prayers shift to what he wants rather than asking God to constantly shift to what our prayers are asking for. You get what I'm saying? And as we shift the what we want to be like what he wants, guess what happens? God starts getting what he wants. He's been doing it forever. I'm not saying it starts in that moment, but we just start realizing it. Oh man. When we pray in Jesus' name, we're praying in line with who he is and what he wants and what he's doing. I love this story of of, um, uh, Mother Teresa, Time Magazine, flew out to Calcutta, uh, I think it was late 80s, and uh, did an article on her. They had many articles over her life. Uh, and, and in one, the, uh, the journalist was asking her, so, so Mother Teresa, when you, when you pray, what do you say to God? And if you've ever watched interviews with her, she's, you know, very, she knows how to be with Jesus. You know, she's got that kind of like, and she just says, well, I don't say anything. I just listen. Right? So he says, okay. So then like, what does he say? <laughs> right? And she says, he doesn't say anything. He just listens. And she had this innate understanding, not innate, she had built this understanding over her life of being with Jesus to know that her prayer life was just to be with him. It wasn't about the conversation, it was about the communion. It's being attentive to Jesus, discovering who Jesus is and what he desires and being with him as we pray for the same things. And the last thing I found is this, is how are we supposed to be with Jesus? We be with Jesus in fellowship. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. He says, and this is the words of Jesus, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. So where are we with Jesus? We're with Jesus when we're together. We're with Jesus in his name, right? Sometimes if you go bowling and you talk about things that are far from God, that may not be with Jesus. But when you come together and you're praying together and we're in the word together and we're talking about how to uh, grow in Christ likeness together and we're shaping and chiseling uh, in, in that way and the spirit's moving in those moments, he's there, he's there. So how are we with Jesus when we're in his presence together? When Jesus was forming his disciples, he called them to fellowship, to life together. When the disciples were sent out, they started fellowshipping communities called churches God is regularly using people and he will use each of us by his spirit to help form, shape, correct, counsel, and set into alignment. And when we are gathered with each other in Jesus' name, he is with us. James chapter four, verse eight, James says this, come close to God and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That word double-minded could also mean chronic doubters. You get the image? We don't have to live in the death and decay of our sinful self. 
we can draw near to God and we will promise that he will draw near to us. The more purified our lives become, the closer we feel and draw near to him. I grew up with this psalm I'm about to read, but I hate to admit it, how often I've read this and forget that this is about God and it's not about me. But I remember, but remembering what we receive when we're with him. And it's Psalm 23. In verse one, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And even there is talking about like, shepherds don't work from home, right? This isn't like a, a, a distant kind of situation. There's not office hours for a shepherd. A shepherd is with his sheep. You get the image? He's, he's, and he's mine. He, he is the one who is with me. He's over me. He's leading me. He's guiding me. He is my shepherd, and I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Pay attention. Why? Because you're with me. Because you're here, I'm good. Because I'm with you, I'm okay. Because I'm with you, my soul's restored. Because I'm with you, I know I'll be led in places of peace and quiet. Because I'm with you, I know I can lie down. I don't have to live defensive. Why? Because you're with me. It says your rod and your staff, they comfort me, right? As long as Jesus is carrying the stick and I'm with him, I'm fine. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I love this. They're coming at me and Jesus is like, you want to grab lunch real quick? We can just do it right here. Well, all this is going on, right? Jersey Mike's, what are we doing, right? So it's kind of like, we, we're okay. We can stop. We don't have to be worried and distracted. We can just be with him while all that's going on. He says, you have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows certainly goodness and faithfulness this Hebrew word hesed and it means mercy grace or loving kindness because you are with me certainly your goodness and your faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life and my dwelling where I am and who I'm with will be with you in the house of the Lord forever this isn't about what we get. It's about who he is and what happens when we're with him. The nature of our good shepherd is that he is with us and we are with him. So long as he is with us, his goodness and his loving kindness will be with us all the days of our life. When Jesus sent it, he gave his commission to his disciples that you will go into all the world and all the nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I've commanded and surely I will be with you always to the very ends of the age. You don't have to do this without him or bump into him along the road. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, John Piper paints an image. He says, Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything above seeing or savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is a not, a, not a way of getting people into heaven. It's a way of getting people to God. It's a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. And if we don't want God above all things, we've not been converted by the gospel. It's the forgiveness that, that takes the separation our sin drove to lead us away from God and it forgives it so that we can be with God. The desire of heaven is not the pearly gates or the golden streets or your mansion that you'll get. The desire of heaven is the fullness of the presence of God for all eternity. Colossians chapter three, verse one says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things that are above, not of the things on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, was revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. You get it? 
If you are still living on your own for yourself, Jesus died forgiving your sins so you don't have to be separated from God. He invited you to die to your decaying way of life and live abiding with your life hidden in Christ. And when Jesus, who is our life, because everything else was put to death, and the only reason we're living is because Jesus didn't stay dead. And so when Christ, who is your life, appears, you appear with him. Don't forget the image of John's vision in Revelation that culminates in this massive moment in Revelation 21. We get this burst open scene of heaven and it says this, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Who's sitting there? So we know who the voice is. Here's what God says. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain for the former things have passed away. Here's a question I want to ask you. Maybe the invitation I want to lead you in asking yourself. Do you have assurance that you will be with God? And for those of us that have been around church for a while, is that the one thing you ask and the one thing that you seek? is for this reality to be your reality, that when Jesus appears, you appear with him, and that this is your story, this is your song, so you can be praising your Savior all the day long. As we read this, are you repenting from living a life away from God? Do you believe in Jesus as Lord over your life, that just to be with him is enough? Because in the world we live in where we're so busy and we're tired and we're exhausted, we will run to so many things trying to solve that problem for us. And how often is it just the presence of God? So we want to align. We want to have a shift in our discipleship. Uh, we want to bring our ways back. We want to repent from living the way we've been living and bring our way back to the Lord and say, God, this is the one thing. Would you stand I'm gonna invite you just to do this. And we're gonna take communion together. But before we do that, what I wanna invite you to do is would you just take a minute to just close your eyes? Maybe even think about where your hands are. Maybe you need to lift them. Maybe you just need to hold them open. Maybe you need to put them in your pocket so they're not doing other things. I don't know. But would you just spend time just being with him. Uh, maybe a good image for you is to kind of walk into the throne room just in your own, with your eyes closed. You know what I mean? And there he is seated on the throne and you know you're probably not as close as you need to be. And hear the words of the author of Hebrews say, you can approach the throne of grace with confidence. He's your ever-present help in your time of need. And maybe that distance, you, you just need to start, as you're praying and being with him, you just need to be closer. You need to walk closer. And so just for a few seconds, would you, just in the quietness of the room, would you just be with the Lord?